Now, this is the most wonderful and deceptive drawing because on the surface, it looks like a very innocent, sweet picture of the goddess Diana sitting modestly clad with one of her handmaidens, Callisto, in a beautiful, tranquil pastoral scene, a goat herd in the background and, and goats quietly munching. But this is entirely an illusion. And to understand how much of an illusion it is, we need to look at the, the myth that's being explored here. So Diana uh, was the Roman uh, goddess of hunting and indeed of, of childbirth. She was a virgin goddess and she had a troop of nymphs who were her handmaidens and Callisto is one of those nymphs. And Callisto comes from the Greek Callisto, meaning most beautiful. In the myth, which is was very well known at this period. We're talking about the 17th century when Laurent painted this. Uh, and it was a very well known story from Ovid's Metamorphoses. In the story, Callisto is sitting quietly uh, by the woodland and a person who she thinks is Diana, her, her goddess uh, comes and sits beside her, but it's not really Diana, it's Jupiter, the king of the gods who has disguised himself as Diana. And first of all, you get this, uh, they have a, a chat. Actually, in the myth, it's more than a chat, it's an embrace. There's quite a bit of female homoeroticism in this myth, which Laurent is rather chaste about. He has them modestly talking and Diana's just touching Callisto very gently. But then Jupiter, disguised as Diana, violently rapes Callisto and she becomes pregnant with a, a, a child who will later be born as her son, Arcas. She tries to conceal the pregnancy from uh, the virgin goddess, Diana, and the other virgin nymphs. But one day later on in her pregnancy, while she's, they're all bathing together, her very pregnant uh, belly is revealed and Diana is furious with her, even though she was raped, she's the innocent party here, but Diana punishes Callisto and expels her from her, her troop of handmaidens. Poor Callisto, she goes off, she gives um, birth to Arcas, uh, her son. Now, meanwhile, Juno, the wife of Jupiter, uh, is furious with Callisto as well for having even though poor Callisto was raped by Juno's husband, Jupiter, Juno is angry with Callisto and punishes her and turns her into a bear. Later on, her son Arcas is now a young man. He's hunting in the forest. He sees a bear. He's about to shoot it dead. It is, in fact, his mother. And at this point, Jupiter steps in, the, the original seducer, indeed rapist, and he uh, saves uh, Callisto, now a bear, by turning her into a, a constellation of stars and she becomes the Ursa Major in the sky and her son Arcas is transformed into Ursa Minor. So what we have here, you can see why Ovid chooses this myth for his uh, work on metamorphoses, on transformations. We have here a tale um, which is actually about the, the power, the forcefulness, the deceptive nature of desire, and also the ability of desire to transform us into other beings, other creatures eventually, into a constellation of stars. What Laurent has done is take what appears to be this very tranquil moment, but actually violence is about to erupt. And we've got this image, this poised moment in time. But poor Callisto, she's about to have her clothes ripped off her. Uh, Diana, who isn't Diana, who is Jupiter, is about to uh, force himself upon her. And we think, well, what's the, the goat herd doing there? Is he going to watch? Is he going to be a voyeur? And we need to remember that in classical thought, goats are also a symbol of unbridled lust and desire. So they have a strong figurative role to play in this uh, drawing because they're not just quite
quietly munching the grass. They're there to symbolize the darker, more uh, powerful elements of human nature. And if you look at the clothing of uh, Diana and Callisto, you'll see particularly in Diana's robes, uh, they seem to be folded in rather a snake-like way, which again reminds us of deceptive snakes, the Garden of Eden. So this, what appears to be this tranquil pastoral scene is not at all what it first appears. Uh, violence is about to erupt. The darker side of desire is about to burst forth. Poor Callisto, the victim, is going to be transformed first into a bear and then into a constellation of stars. She's the one who's going to be punished, excluded from the troop of nymphs. And Laurent has all done this very tastefully, very beautifully, but he's woven in the symbols of the snakes. In fact, some of the branches of the trees look rather snake-like, and he's got the, the goats, the unbridled lust of the goats in the background. And in fact, Laurent's take on this myth is very interesting and unusual. He's, he's shown the stage before the rape with Jupiter uh, disguised as Diana, apparently just gently caressing Callisto. There's something just wonderfully simple and, yes, obvious about uh, Barocci's sketch, uh, about his drawing. It's two women greeting each other. What's more normal than that? So this looks just like a simple greeting, the kind of greeting that you might see at a train station or in the centre of a town or city, or maybe even on your way to the gallery today. And we can tell from the drawing that one woman is older and one woman is younger. But maybe, as with many greetings, there's more than what's, uh, what first appears to the eye. Um, what you can't tell underneath those beautifully drawn copious clothes is that both these women are expecting. Elizabeth, the older woman, uh, was considered to be way, way past uh, childbearing age. Uh, it was no longer considered possible for her to have children. Um, but she miraculously conceives uh, and her child will be called John, and he will grow up to be John the Baptist, who is the, the one that heralds, who says that the Messiah uh, is coming to watch out and to look out for the Messiah. Uh, and the other figure, the younger figure, is Mary. Uh, and I suspect we may know that Mary is the mother of Jesus, and she's carrying uh, Jesus within her womb at that very moment of greeting. So she calls out to her cousin, to, to Elizabeth, the older lady, and it says in, the, uh, in the Luke's Gospel that the, the baby within Elizabeth's womb jumps for joy as if already he's recognising the Messiah uh, within Mary's own body. Uh, I kind of like the fact that maybe uh, that slightly stern face of Elizabeth is, is not some kind of um, her feeling disgruntled, but just a bit of an ouch at a, at a baby that is jumping for joy within her. So take a second look at those um, everyday greetings that you see happening all around you. There is always more going on and there may be signs of hope there too. This is an extraordinary and mysterious and complicated drawing which is just full of possible interpretations. So in the centre we have Diana, the goddess of the hunt, surrounded by her hunting dogs. But immediately there are questions. So Diana is a virgin goddess. She's normally very sort of chastely portrayed. But here her clothes are, are sort of falling off her. She has a breast exposed. Um, so she's showing really quite a lot of flesh, uh, very muscular uh, physique. Again, she's very gender fluid. Immediately we're thinking, well, this goddess, the virgin goddess, the chaste goddess, she's dressed in really rather a louche manner. Uh, she's quite a sinister figure here. She's, her dogs hunt not just uh, other animals, they can hunt 
males, humans who spy on her, as in the myth of Actaeon, who's ripped to pieces by her hounds when he's uh, caught watching Diana bathing in a pool, so that the dogs are pretty sinister creatures. But the dogs are also ambiguous. We've got two sort of slavering at her feet, ready to rip into the chase. We've got another sleeping. And then at the bottom of the picture, there appears to be a dog that has died. The posture appears to show that it's uh, in a stage of uh, death and it's being nuzzled and by another dog who I think is concerned and worried and doesn't quite understand what has happened. Are these hunting dogs perhaps not as powerful as Diana would like them to be? So that's the message I'm picking up. These dogs, which are all about helping Diana to control desire, control the desire of humanity, are actually maybe not that successful. And then if your eye travels up in the, the drawing, I think this is the message that comes out, that actually we've got desire bursting out through this image. On the right-hand side, we have a tower, which is it seems to me very clearly phallic in design, very deliberately, obviously phallic. In the top left-hand corner, we have two absolutely ferocious, barely tamed horses. Um, one is neighing and rearing up its head. Now horses, going right back at least to Plato's dialogue, the Phaedrus, which he writes in the fourth century uh, BCE, the horses are, have long been a symbol of, of lust and the appetites and untrammeled desire. And here it appears that they're just running amok. There's a, a rather sinister looking man behind one of the horses. Is he there, supposed to be there? their tamer? Is he supposed to be a charioteer? He doesn't appear to be in control at all. And his expression is, is deeply troubling. It's, it's quite a violent, really almost an evil expression. Is he in, enjoying watching lust become unbridled like this? What's going on there? So this to me is an image all about human uh, passion and our attempts to control it. That's the figure of the virgin goddess, Diana with her hunting dogs, who hunt down any man who tries to look at her when she's uh, naked. But actually our attempts to control passion are rarely successful, that uh, desire bursts through, that we can't tame the horses of uh, eros of love, and desire within us, and that the dogs who are supposed to be uh, helping Diana chase in human desire are, in fact, themselves fragile, weak, one appears to be dead. And in this image, we clearly have horses symbolizing unbridled human passion. And this is an image that comes up again and again, particularly in the Renaissance and the 17th century. So for me, this image is all about human passion, our attempts to control it, to tame it, as symbolized by the, the virgin uh, goddess of the hunt, Diana, and her dogs who are supposed to track down any man who, who watches her bathe, who doesn't control his desire. But actually, these attempts to tame desire are rarely successful. We see the image of the phallus on the right, we see the, the wild, uh, ho unbridled horses, which their, their charioteer, their rider can't control. So this is all about human lust bursting out at the seam. And no matter how, even with a goddess trying to control it, she's not going to be successful in the long run. Well, this drawing looks a little bit like a rowdy scene from the pub. Uh, and I must admit, I love the dog in this drawing that's kind of quizzically looking up and asking what on earth is going on. Uh, and if I'd been there at the time, I think probably I'd have the same expression as the dog. Um, this is a, a, uh, uses a, a Renaissance device of trying to tell the whole story in the same drawing, in the same work. 
So they're not different people, they're just the same people at different parts of the narrative. And this is a story that takes place after Easter Sunday morning. So Jesus has been arrested, he's been tried on trumped up charges, he's been beaten and he's died in the most horrific way upon a Roman cross. Uh, and his followers, uh, maybe from a distance, but have known that's happened and have seen that's happened and borne witness to all that pain and all that suffering. And even though the women have come from the empty tomb uh, and they've given reports of an angel saying that he's risen, um, the male disciples dismiss it. They say, this is, this is nonsense, this is idle talk. We can't make sense of this. Uh, and two of the disciples, Cleopas and, a, and an unnamed disciple, have just had enough. And so they walk away from uh, the scene of sorrow and the scene of pain. They decide to leave Jerusalem and, and to kind of get out of there. And they're walking away uh, from the city and where everything has taken place. And that's what you see in, right at the back. You see two shadowy figures, and that's Cleopas and the, and the disciple beginning their journey. And as they walk along, they're joined by a, a kind of mysterious stranger. So that the next little group here, you can see that there's now three of them. Uh, and the stranger asks, well, what, are you, what are you talking about as you walk along the road? Which is one of those duh moments. Um, the two disciples say, well, don't you know? Don't you know everything that's been happening in Jerusalem? Uh, we might say today, have you not been keeping up with social media? Don't you know what's happened? Uh, and the first, the stranger listens to them outpour everything that's happened over the past few days, including uh, Jesus' death and what the women had been saying as well. And he just listens. And then it includes the most sad line, I think, in the whole of the Gospels. We had hoped, we had hoped that he would be the one uh, to redeem and rescue the nation. We had hoped. Uh, and I just think that's so desperately sad to have hope and then have it utterly destroyed. Uh, and after listening, only after listening, does the stranger then talk to them. Uh, and we don't know all of what the stranger said, but he seems to be making connections between what's happened and other parts of, of scripture, other holy writings. Trying to make sense of the, the sort of catastrophic few days. And they're so compelled, maybe comforted, by, maybe um, um, com drawn by this mysterious stranger that when they get to the inn for the night they persuade the stranger to stay with them and the scene in the in the drawing then shifts to the inside the inn and you can see that they're all gathered around that table with the quizzical dog and the the stranger um, takes a piece of bread a very ordinary thing to do but he then gives thanks and then breaks it and then shares it now that's a, a pattern that's turned up already in the gospel story. And it's at that moment that those two disciples realise that this mysterious stranger is Jesus all along. And at that moment, Jesus disappears from their sight and they decide, despite the fact that they were so weary before, despite the fact that it's now late in the evening, they decide to rush back to the, to the beginning. They go all the way back to Jerusalem. So this story reminds me that sometimes in the most ordinary places and ordinary conversations um, and the most ordinary breaking and sharing and giving thanks, um, sometimes restored relationships and new hope uh, and life can indeed begin again. This again is an image full of hidden symbolism. So on the surface, we have Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, scolding one of her sons, Cupid. And Cupid is also being bound to a tree by his brother, another, another Cupid. So that's all we get on the surface. And to understand it, we need to understand the myth that Guercino is working with. It's a myth um, which tells the story of Cupid and Psyche, Psyche meaning soul, breath of life in ancient Greek. It's a myth that goes back to the classical Greek world, but in fact was most famous at this period in the 17th century due to a Roman writer retelling it, a writer called Apuleius in the second century after Christ. And he wrote a book called The Golden Ass, 
otherwise known as the Metamorphoses, and this is one of the fantastic tales that he retells. There was a king and queen. They had a very beautiful daughter called Psyche, and she was so beautiful that people all in the countryside around were worshipping her as if she were a goddess. They were saying, well, maybe she is a kind of goddess. Maybe she's a child of Venus. Now, the real goddess, Venus, gets very, very jealous of Psyche, and she wants to take her revenge. So she sends her son, Cupid, with his love darts to Psyche, and the instruction to Cupid is, put one of your love darts into Psyche and make her fall in love with the most hideous person or thing imaginable as a way of getting revenge. But Cupid accidentally scratches himself with one of his own love darts. He's infected with his own love potion. So when he uh, sees Psyche for the first time, he falls hopelessly in love with her. And they start a, a clandestine affair, though Cupid conceals his identity from Psyche, at least initially. Now, when Venus uh, Cupid's mother and Psyche's rival finds out about this. She is furious with Cupid. He has not carried out her instructions. He didn't uh, put one of his darts into Psyche. He hasn't made her fall in love with some hideous monster. And that's why Venus is so angry with Cupid and is punishing him, scolding him in this picture, and why she's happy that his brother, the other Cupid, is tying him up to a tree. So again, we have a story of desire being punished. So Cupid, who should be the god of love, the god of desire, is now being punished by his own mother for his own desire. So we've got a very complicated take. Is it okay to lust after somebody else or isn't it? The story says that desire needs to be controlled, but the, the uh, message we take away is that actually desire is impossible to control. In this drawing by Spinelli, we have uh, a group of men uh, and a woman kneeling, which might make us very uncomfortable in this day and age and question what's going on. They are all towering over her. Some of them are um, some of them are looking directly at her, but many are muttering to one another and looking incredibly disgruntled. Between the men, there's a, a division. You'll see that some have circles around their heads, halos to show that they are holy. Uh, and these are Jesus' disciples. Uh, and then there's the rest of the men, maybe including uh, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Um, the disciples are either looking at Jesus or they're looking at the women or they're looking at the other men. But without exception, the, the other men are looking at themselves and only themselves, talking and, and mumbling. None of them are looking at the woman herself. She's just become a principal. She's just become something to talk about. They're not really seeing her. This is a story of Jesus being cornered uh, and Jesus is the figure towards one side of the drawing, almost as if he is being pushed uh, against the edge. And there's some teachers of the law um, some Pharisees have brought a woman caught in the act of adultery before him. Now I have no idea how you catch somebody in the very act of adultery. Uh, have they been watching her? Which is, all sounds terribly creepy. And of course it takes two to tango, it takes two to commit adultery and the man is nowhere to be seen. He's not being held to account in the same kind of way. And so they bring her before uh, this, uh, th this rabbi, Rabbi Jesus, uh, th this teacher, and they kind of corner him by saying, well, the law of Moses says this should happen. Uh, she should be stoned to death. So what are you going to do? And so he's faced with a dilemma. Uh, does he um, uh, let her go? In which case he's soft on the law, which is in something incredibly crucial and important in this community. Or uh, if he doesn't let her go, if he lets the, the law proceed, then is he really there for the outcast and those that make mistakes and those that mess up? And so he's, he's cornered uh, and it's a, a situation, a dilemma that maybe lots of politicians find themselves in. Parents sometimes find themselves in. Do they stick to the rules or do they bend them? Um, anybody with any, that makes any kind of judgment will recognise this kind of dilemma. 
What Jesus does instead is that he bends down and writes in the dust. Uh, and there's all sorts of reasons why he might have done that. Um, maybe to give the woman time to put her rose back on, to cover herself up, and she does look robed again in this picture, to give her a bit of dignity, uh, to take the attention away from her, uh, and also maybe to buy a bit of time, buy a bit of silence, take the heat out of a very loaded situation, a very explosive situation, uh, and to let everybody, including himself, think. And he writes in the dust, we don't know, it doesn't say anywhere in, in the Gospel what he wrote. But I, I like the thought that maybe he's reminding everybody that actually we're all made of the same stuff. Uh, we're all dust, no matter uh, what mistakes we happen to have made. And then in the end he rises and he says to the crowd, um, those of you who've uh, never made a mistake, those of you who never sinned, you can throw the first stone. Uh, and one by one, beginning with the eldest and maybe the wisest, they drop their stones uh, and they leave. Uh, and the, only the woman is left. Uh, and he says, uh, does anybody condemn you? And she says, no. And he says, well, neither do I. And you can see in the drawing that his hand is raised in blessing. Go and sin, make no more mistakes. Uh, and then the story ends. But it, it reminds me to be very careful about the judgments that I make on other people. Um, would I want those same judgments made on me? Uh, and it reminds me that when everybody's ready to rush and condemn, to sometimes just take a step back and take a breather and to think, and sometimes to protect those who face uh, a barrage of criticism from other people. Now, in this uh, image, we have Silenus, who's the father of the satires, uh, celebrating his victory in a poetic contest. And what really interests me about this image is the way it shows how depictions of the satires change over time. So satires were originally part human and part animal creatures, and they were followers of the wild god uh, Dionysus Bacchus in uh, Roman mythology, who was god of wine and song and general revelry and, and passion. Initially, in the uh, Greek uh, world, they were depicted as half human and half horse. Later, in the Hellenistic period, later on in the Greek world, they become half human and half goat. Goats being uh, associated with the god Pan and again, seen as symbols of unbridled lust. And they're complicated creatures because on the one hand, yes, they're all about the darker, untamable aspects of human nature, the, the stuff to do with sex and drink that we can't control. But they also have this capacity uh, for music and poetry. Indeed, Silenus, the father of the satires, is the tutor of the god Dionysus who later becomes uh, Bacchus in, in Roman mythology. So they have this dual nature. Over time, their animal aspects become diminished and artists focus more and more on their human elements. And this is what we get here in the 16th century by this follower of Mantegna, because we really don't see any animal attributes in this silliness. Though he doesn't appear entirely human either, he's much bigger, he's much stronger and more muscular. So what we're seeing here is the Renaissance adapting classical myths and mythology, but rather downplaying the ferociously untamable sexual and drunken elements and concentrating much more on the music, the poetry, the ideal of the Renaissance man.